In the name of Jesus, amen. Peter says, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in various kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor of Jesus Christ. Peter writes this to Christians who were undergoing persecution, so they were familiar with suffering, sometimes very intense. And Peter knew in the back of his mind that he would be undergoing it as well, because Jesus told him that he would. And so Peter offers us a perspective on suffering that is way different than what the world tells us, way different sometimes than how we look at it too suffering. Nobody likes it. Certainly not pleasant. But there's a, a theology that's adopted that sometimes is referred to as a theology of glory. And of the many ways that we could understand or define a theology of glory, perhaps as it relates to suffering, it might go like this. That when it comes to suffering, according to the theology of glory, the only good outcome of suffering is the end of it. And so that's where the focus goes. When suffering is happening, the only positive outcome there could be is that it ends. When I was a vicar, one thing you need to know about vicars, if you've been around the church, you do know this, vicars are generally dumb. Uh, we're supposed to be dumb. We know our theology, but we've never had to apply it takes a lot of practice to do that, and I was dumb, and was definitely falling into a trap of the theology of glory, because when I would go visit sick and shut-in people, and if they were especially suffering, usually I would try and find something positive to latch onto so that this could be an upbeat visit something positive that maybe they've been hearing. So oftentimes I'd start the conversations with, well, what are the doctors saying? And if the member says, well, we're going to have surgery and then we're going to try this medication and the doctor's optimistic that it should turn out pretty well, well, good. That's what we latch on to. We're going to leave this room happy because there is hope that the suffering is going to end. Then my pastor sent me to uh, visit one of our members, and there just wasn't any of that optimistic outlook. I started with the same question, what are the doctors saying? And he said, well, it doesn't look very good. It, they're saying it's not very good. Oh. Well, um, is there anything else they can try? Have they said they're going to try something new? He says, no, they actually have said they've tried everything. Oh. Well, at least, how are you feeling today? Is, is today a, an okay day? No, I'm not feeling good today, and I haven't for a long time. Oh. Well, of course, I read the Word and had a prayer, but I went back and I looked kind of deflated because my pastor saw me and he said, what happened, Vicar? What's wrong? And I said, well, I just, there's just no hope. I mean, he's telling me that the, there's, the, the outlook isn't good. He's feeling terrible. And I think my pastor saw right through what was going on, and he leaned forward, and he says, Kurt, that's not what you're there for. You let the doctors and the medical staff give whatever earthly hope they may or may not have, but you are there to deliver the gospel and the love of God and the promise of the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life that comes through Christ. Duh. That's a theology of the cross. A theology of glory says that the only possible good outcome of suffering is the end of it. Theology of the cross says, no, the best possible outcome to suffering is a closer relationship with God. Nobody likes suffering, but it provides us an opportunity. And that's what Peter's talking about here, an opportunity that can result in praise and glory and honor of Christ. A theology of the cross during suffering says that suffering affords us a unique opportunity to relate to the sufferings of Christ. At this time in our lives when we are suffering, perhaps we can grasp better what Christ was going through, and any time we're gazing at the cross, faith is strengthened. 
There at the cross, we see the, the visible, marvelous display of what God's love looks like. In fact, at the cross, we have the prime example of who God really is. Someone who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And in our times of suffering, maybe that's a unique time for us where we can grasp that better. Giving us more hope than anything the world can give. Martin Luther, in his sermon at Coburg on the cross and suffering, also promotes another thing about what Peter's talking about here in 1 Peter, in that Luther points out that suffering can help free us from complacency. Complacency. So you and I probably have experienced this. When things in life are going swimmingly well, it's easy to forget about God. Suffering can pull us out of that. At my first congregation, we had a member by the name of Pickle. Yes, Pickle, that's what everybody called him. I don't even think I knew his real name. He was just Pickle. He grew up in our church. He'd been around our small community all his life. Pickle was a fringe member of our church. Didn't really come that much. Pickle was too busy. Pickle had other things going on, a heavy social calendar. His kids came to our school. His wife, we'd see her more, but not so much Pickle. Well, Pickle's grandma, who was a pillar of our congregation, she was older and then she got sick and frankly she suffered and then she died and it threw Pickle because they were very close. And so Pickle came into my office and he asked the question that is so often asked in the wake of suffering, why? And he points uh, to his grandma and said, this woman was nothing but a faithful servant of Christ all her life. She was here all the time. She raised her family in the church. She had such influence on, on me and even on my kids. Why would God allow this kind of suffering at the end of her life? And I answered, I don't know. But I do know this, I do know that she was full of faith, that she knew who her Lord is, and she knew where she was going. And I'll tell you something else, Pickle, that didn't come by accident. It's because she has been here, because she has spent her life in the Word. She has received the sacrament of Christ's body and blood all of her life, so that when the worst time in her life came, she was ready. Hmm, Pickle said, hmm, maybe I should go to church more. And then he sat up and he says, you know what, I think I will. I think I'm going to start coming to church more. Now, if I had a nickel for everybody that told me they were going to start going to church more, I'd be wearing better shoes than this. But he did. He actually did. He's showing up. He's in church on Sundays, he's in the Word, he's getting involved, he's coming to the sacrament. I just saw Pickle about seven or eight months ago and how much he had become like his grandma. And so much of this as a result of suffering. Her suffering, his suffering over her suffering. God pulled him out of his complacency. Suffering is difficult. Nobody wants it. It's unpleasant. And it is certainly appropriate to pray for the end of it. But that's not the only possible good outcome. We can be pulled from complacency, and our focus can be put back on God through His Word. And in our sufferings, we have a unique opportunity to grasp the sufferings of Christ, gaze at the cross, marvel at his love for us in his death and resurrection, which gives us the real hope, a hope far greater than any hope the world can give, and which will result in the praise and glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with our hymn.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of another day to serve you and worship you. Please bless us and be with us in the many tasks of the day and to give us strength and energy and health for all the things we are called to do. Today we include special petitions for the father of Janessa Doucette, who suffered a stroke and is hospitalized, for the son-in-law of Professor Ken Harris, who is having surgery today, also for Nicole Guarnero, who is recovering from surgery. Heavenly Father, for these your servants and all who look to you for healing, we pray for wisdom and skill for the doctors and all who attend to them, for healing according to your gracious will, and for strength and for comfort in your love and presence in their time of need. Dear Father, we also lift up events on our campus this weekend. We pray your blessings on the Feed My Starving Children packing effort. Grant safety to all involved and bless the efforts of all, and especially student Isaiah Mudge who coordinated this event, that many would be moved by the cause of helping the hungry. We pray for our instrumental music ensembles as they have concerts this weekend, that performers would have good health and that many would be blessed by the gift of music. Hear these and all the prayers on our hearts and in our minds as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, amen.